So if you haven't seen my motor effect videos, then please have a look at that first before moving on to electromagnetic induction. But if you have seen those, then let's crack on. We said before that if you have uh, a current moving through a piece of wire and that's in a magnetic field, then there is gonna be a force applied on that piece of wire. But it also works the other way around as well. If we move a wire through a magnetic field and it is part of a complete circuit, then the electrons are actually going to move. We are inducing a current and therefore a voltage or an EMF, we're inducing electricity in this wire due to electromagnetic induction. So let's just make sure that we're clear on the rules that we have. The motor effect, that's Fleming's left-hand rule. And we can remember this, if you're British, then we can say that motor cars drive on the left. I'm sorry if that doesn't work for you because you're in another country. And we said that those are our three things. Force, thumb thrust, first field, and second finger is the current. It's when we can say that current makes force. If I can put it crudely like that, current makes force. When we have a current, when we're making force, we use the left-hand rule. But what if we have a force making a current? We're inducing a current. We're now talking about the dynamo effect. And because it is effectively just the opposite of the motor effect, we don't use Fleming's left-hand rule, but rather Fleming's right-hand rule. How can we remember this? The dynamo effect is used in generators. So we can use this terrible pun, generator. I'd like to thank my mate Pete for that one. So it's exactly the same with thumb being the thrust, first finger being the field, and second finger be in the current. So that's how we remember which one we're supposed to use. Fleming's left hand rule for the motor effect, motor cars drive on the left. Fleming's right hand rule used for generators, generator, the dynamo effect. So we do have a problem with this then, don't we? Because if we have a current going through a piece of wire and that's causing it to go downwards, then we're getting a current to make a force. But the problem with that then is that we have a force and that force in turn makes a current as well. So it seems like we cannot have one without the other, and that's absolutely true. But it does make sense if we think about it. Let's go back to our magnets with a wire in between. So north, this is south. So that means our magnetic field is going in this direction. We have our wire that is part of a circuit going through here. And we have a current going in that direction. So that is going to produce, according to Fleming's left-hand rule, a force going upwards. But also, so now we have a wire moving through a magnetic field. We now actually have the dynamo effect as well. So now we have to bring in Fleming's right-hand rule. Our field is going to the right. We have a force going upwards. So that actually means that we have our second finger going back up the other way. So what happens? Dynamo effect tries to stop the motor effect. It also goes the other way around as well. Let's say we're starting with a wire and we actually force it downwards. Let's get our Fleming's right-hand rule. So field's going that way, force is going downwards. Our current is going to be going in this direction here. But the problem is now, is we have a current going through a piece of wire, so we now have to bring in Fleming's left-hand rule. Let's just check it, feels going that way, current's going that way. We're actually producing a force going in the opposite direction. Huh, so once again, the motor effect tries to stop the dynamo effect. We basically just arrived using that idea Lenz's law. That is, the direction of an induced current is such that it will oppose the change that caused it. So let's just apply Lenz's law to this situation here. We have our wire that we're pushing downwards and that's producing a current in the wire. But that current in the wire in turn produces its own equal and opposite force that's going to try and push it back upwards. 
What do we see happening? These two forces are equal. If we apply a force on a piece of wire through a magnetic field, it effectively reaches terminal velocity because the reaction force due to the motor effect is going to be equals to the force that we're applying to begin with. There's no better example of Lenz's law than when we have a coil of wire that is a solenoid as part of a circuit and we get a magnet and we drop it through this solenoid. This magnet has its own permanent magnetic field. Now it could draw some field lines on there what happens as this magnet falls through, the flux of the magnet cuts, as it were, it crosses the wire, it crosses the solenoid as it goes down. As the flux passes through or cuts through the wire, or we can say the other way around, that the wire is cutting through the flux, doesn't matter which way around it is, this wire experiences a change in flux. So we are gonna have a current being induced in this wire. The electrons are going to move. Now we're dropping it in north end first. Now let's just have a think about this logically. This magnet falls through. As it cuts the wire, it produces a current. It induces a current in the wire. That current in the wire produces its own magnetic field as well. And the question is, which end of this solenoid is going to be the temporary magnetic fields, North Pole and South Pole? Let's have a think about it. If you have a magnet going in and we have a south pole being induced in this solenoid at the top, we know that north pole and south pole attract each other. What's going to happen? The magnet is going to speed up. As it speeds up, what happens? The magnetic field produced by the current in the wire gets stronger and it attracts it even more. So if it was a south pole being induced at the top here to begin with, then that would mean that this magnet would accelerate faster and faster and faster and it would just go whew, like that. So we're in effect getting energy for nothing. But we know due to Lenz's law that whatever current is induced, it will try and stop the change that caused it to begin with. So what makes more sense then? If the North Pole comes in, we actually have a North Pole being induced at the top. Therefore, we have to have a South Pole at the bottom. Just one thing that's useful to know, how can we tell which way the current is being induced in this solenoid here? Well, if we look from above, a little eye, and we're looking down on this solenoid here, we can say that if we have a North Pole, then the ends of that end, if we put arrows on the end, are going anti-clockwise. So if you have a North Pole induced at the top, and we're looking down, then that means our current is going to be going anti-clockwise. What about from the bottom? Well, if you draw an S and we put arrows on the end of that S, we see that the arrows are actually going clockwise. So that's how we can predict what direction the current goes in when induced in a solenoid. So what happens? If we have a North Pole being induced at the top of our solenoid, that means that we have repulsion, and that's due to Lenz's law. In other words, the solenoid doesn't want the magnet to enter it, so it's trying to stop it. So what happens? It actually reaches terminal velocity. As one of these magnets falls through this solenoid, it actually produces a force that is equal and opposite to the magnet's weight, and it falls at a terminal velocity. This is the same for a solenoid, and it also works for just a pipe as well, which you can think of as an infinite number of these little loops going down. If that's the case, then we need to have energy lost somewhere. And whether it's a solenoid or a pipe, ultimately energy gets lost as heat, as we have a current set up here and we have energy dissipated as heat due to the resistance. Hang about though, once our magnets actually exited the solenoid, if we still have a south pole here on our solenoid, doesn't that mean that the south pole is going to repel the south pole of the magnet and it's going to push it away and accelerate it? Well, we know that can't be the case due to Lenz's law. The coil of wire tries to stop the magnet from coming in by producing an equal and opposite force. But the weird thing is, is on the way out, the coil of wire tries to stop it from leaving. In other words, Lenz's law means that magnets and wires always want what they can't have. The coil of wire doesn't want the magnet to come in, but once it's in, it doesn't want it to leave. That must mean that on the way out, we have attraction due to Lenz's law. 
So we have to have a North Pole at the bottom of our solenoid now and a South Pole at the top. What does that mean? Well, that means that between the magnet entering the coil and exiting the coil, we actually have a complete flip of magnetic field induced in this coil of wire. That must mean that the current starts going one way, but then halfway through it flips and starts going the other way. So Lenz's law we know is the direction of the induced current is such that it will oppose the change that caused it. In other words, magnets and wires don't like change. I mean, who of us does, right? So let's just recap. So three steps. Magnet comes in, its magnetic flux cuts the wire. That means a current is induced in the wire, in the solenoid. That produces its own magnetic field that actually opposes the magnet coming in. Somewhere between, as it falls through, halfway down, the magnet's actually on the way out. So that means that the solenoid again doesn't want that to happen. The current in the solenoid and the circuit flips, goes the other way, reverses the magnetic field set up and attracts it. That's why the velocity of the magnet will be constant going all the way down. So that's the basics of the dynamo effect and electromagnetic induction and Lenz's law. If you're okay with this, then it's time to look at Faraday's law, which is all about how we calculate the EMF, that's the voltage induced in a wire. If you think I've missed anything or if you have any questions, please put a comment down below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Bye for now.